And so I was preaching my message, and I say, look at the screen, and there was nothing on the screen. And I say, what's wrong with those guys up there? Well, I, it would help if I gave them the information to put up on the screen. You know how I always blame the sound man for everything? I got a little newsflash for you. It's never their fault. It's always my fault, but I'm never going to admit it. <laughs> Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. What I'm doing this morning is I am continuing, in fact, concluding the message I began last week entitled, 21 Words to a Better You. And uh, it took taking me two weeks to get through this, but that's okay. And we talked about these 21 words that actually make us better people. And this is what the 21 words are. Here they are up here. The six most important words are, I admit I made a mistake. The five most important words are, you did a good job. The four most important words are, what is your opinion? The three most important words are, if you please. The two most important words are, thank you. And the one most important word is, we. Now, where we began last week was this, and I'll just bring you up to speed real quick here, is we began with this fact that there is a least important word, and it's the word me. And when we get focused on me, myself, and I, then all the rest of these words are become nil and, or null and of no effect. And really, we have to get off of ourselves and get onto others if we really want to become better people. What we did last week was we talked about the, the, the number one most important word, which was the word we. We will accomplish way more together than we ever will as individuals. So that was the first thing. Then we talked about the two most important words being thank you and the three most important words being if you please. Please and thank you. I called that the gratitude sandwich, right? Because when you say please and thank you, amazing things happen in between. Well, this morning we're going to carry on and I'm going to start with the four most important words and they are this. What is your opinion? What is your opinion? Now, if you have uh, opened up in Proverbs chapter 1, I'm going to read you verse 5. And I want you to listen very carefully because it defines what a wise man is. And you decide for yourself whether you're a wise man or not. It says, a wise man will hear and increase learning. And a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Do you know what it says a wise man is? It says a wise man is not someone who's smarter than everybody else. A wise man is not someone with a great amount and vast amounts of knowledge. A wise man is someone who can hear others and will attain wise counsel. It's absolutely true. A really smart person, a really wise person, isn't someone who knows everything, but someone who knows where to get the information and to ask people for advice when they don't know. And this point of what is your opinion is so incredibly valuable to becoming better people. Now, I know there's two names that in our generation will go down in history as defining technology. And those two names are Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And irrespective of what you think of the products of Apple or Microsoft has nothing to do with what I'm going to say. But when I think when history records our generation, it's going to be far more favorable to Bill Gates than to Steve Jobs. You say, why is that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because for one thing, Steve Jobs was obsessed with making a better Apple computer. Well, uh, whereas Bill Gates has actually, at least in the last number of years, been obsessed with making a better world. He has taken $31 billion of his fortune and donated it to charity. He, is, he became the world's richest man, and now he's on his way to becoming the world's poorest man. And I mean, it's really remarkable when you think of a guy like Bill Gates that he has been able to make so much money. I mean, have you seen the guy? He's about as nerdy as they get, right? I mean, here he is. I mean, let's just have a quick look at this. I'm not insulting him. But he made $54 billion, and he's got a $9 haircut. <laughs> and you know what? He didn't always look like that. He looked much better when he was younger. Look, see how much, how much better he looked when he was younger? You know, if there's one thing I've learned from the, the likes of Bill Gates and Donald Trump, it's this, that the more money you have, the worse the haircut that goes with it. <laughs> you know, I mean, the fact that I've got such great hair, 
is only an indication of how poorly I'm paid. <laughs> But I wanna, here's what I want to say about, about Bill Gates, where I think Bill Gates and Steve Jobs stand apart, because they had very, very different leadership uh, techniques. And this is what Bill Gates always said. He said the key for us, number one, has always been to hire very smart people. Bill Gates always knew that he wasn't smart enough to change the world. He always knew that what he needed to do was surround himself with people who were smaller, smarter than him. Here was the thing. The, the difference between Bill Gates and Steve Jobs was this. S Steve Jobs always wanted to be the smartest man in the room, whereas Bill Gates always wanted to have others who were smarter than him in the room. What's that all about? That is about somebody that understood these words. What is your opinion? I don't know if you've ever heard this story. After Steve Jobs passed away, Bill Gates had a dream one night. And uh, in this dream, Steve Jobs appeared to me, or to him rather, and so he asked him this question. He says, Steve, what's heaven like? He says, heaven is perfect. And Bill says, what's perfect about it? He says, I'll tell you what's perfect about it. There are no fences and there are no walls. He says, what's so perfect about that? He says, this is why it's perfect. There's no need for any gates or any windows. I want to show you another proverb, and I want to, it's in Proverbs chapter 18, and, and it's verse 1. And let me tell you while you're going there, is, let me tell you this, is that when we ask people for their opinion, we're not just being polite. We become better people when we ask others for their opinion. I'll tell you why. Two reasons. Number one, first of all, you honor them. And you, you give them the sense that they have some intelligence and they have something to offer to the conversation because they do. But secondly, as a result of asking for their opinion, guess what? You become smarter as a result of it. And here's the thing I want you to know. You know, you in this room all know people who never shut up, right? You say, aren't I looking at one right now? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> But you all know these people that never shut up. You might be one of these people. People who never stop talking are never learning anything, right? Because anything they say, they already know, right? And so the only way you're going to become smarter and wiser in this world is by asking others, what is your opinion? Now, I want you to look at this Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. Listen to what it says. It says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. Do you know what he's talking about there? You know what the proverb is saying here? It's saying this is what the fool does. The wise man, he already told us, was the one who, who heard and asked others for counsel. The fool is one whose only delight is in expressing their own opinion. And you all know people like that. You get in any situation, all they do is they talk and they talk and they talk and they talk and they completely wear you out. And they almost never impress you. I love to talk to people, don't get me wrong. And I love to interact with people and, and discuss things and have a discourse that goes two ways. But when someone corners me, traps me, and talks at me, you've all been there. Nothing is more annoying than that. The other night, I got trapped in a situation like that. And this guy trapped me, and I was the only other male at this get-together. And so he got a hold of me, and he went at me. And for two hours, he told me of his philosophy of life and his worldview. And I just sat there, <laughs> rolling my head back in my eyes and listening. And I knew he wasn't open to anything I had to say. And after two, two hours, this is what he said to me. He said, would you not agree with all of that? To which I said, no. <laughs> that was my entire contribution to the discussion. You say, why didn't you answer him? There was no point. It, I wasn't going to get anywhere with him. He actually didn't care what I thought. He wasn't asking my opinion. He just wanted me to agree with him. This is what the scripture says. Do not answer a fool in his folly, lest you become with him or like him. And the, what we're talking about is the fact that you don't engage people in something that's not going to end up anywhere. When we begin to inquire of the opinions of others, we become smarter and more skilled as a result. I'm going to tell you a little story here that happened to me. Oh, it was quite a few years ago. Uh, I had a, we had to do some roofing at our place, and I, I got the prices for it and realized they were going to charge more, way more for the labor than the actual shingles. The shingles were a small part of it, and the labor was like 75, 80% of it. So I thought to myself, you know what, maybe I could figure out how to do this on my own. Now, that was the days before YouTube. YouTube's great because you can learn how to do anything, right? You can learn brain surgery and heart surgery and everything. <laughs> YouTube is fantastic. It's all there on the internet for you. 
But in, in those days, there was no YouTube, and I was trying to figure out how could I figure out how to roof a house. Uh, somehow there's got to be a way. And I was driving down Bishop Grandin, and as I was driving down Bishop Grandin, they were just building Island Lakes down there. There was all these brand new houses going up, and I looked and I could see there was a roofer on top of this house, two-story house in Island Lakes. And I knew what I needed to do. I drove into Island Lakes, I drove into this driveway, I climbed up of this ladder onto the roof, just about startled the guy to the point where he fell off. He wasn't expecting a visitor. And I climbed up the ladder and I said, hey, he, uh, <laughs> and I said, I have a quick question for you. Do you think you could teach me how to do this? He says, teach you how to do what? I said, teach me how to roof. I need to do it next week. Do you think you can teach me that? He said, sure. He says, grab that bundle. <laughs> the best way to learn is by doing it. And so I grabbed this bundle and started roofing with this guy. I spent two hours up on this roof, and he explained it all the way along. He says, here's the tabs, and you line it up like this, and this is how you do your chalk line. And he showed me where to put the nails, and he showed me how to cut the edge. He told me how to put on the roof cap. After two hours, I was all dirty and all sweaty, but I was now a professional roofer. <laughs> The next week, I was doing my own place. And guess what? I had a bunch of other people up there on the roof with me to help me. Guess what I was doing? Teaching them. <laughs> Teaching them. <laughs> because I was now the expert. I'd had a two-hour lesson. And you think, you, are you telling me the truth? You ask Kathy about this. I, that's how I learned a roof. I went and asked some guy up on that roof. And here's the thing I've discovered about people. If they actually know something, particularly a guy, they're more than happy to tell you. Because people like to talk about their favorite subject, which is themselves. And so there's no worries there. So we actually become smarter people and better people when we ask others for their opinion. Now, let me give you a little caveat here, because sometimes we make a mistake. Sometimes we ask for an opinion, but don't take it. And what's the point in doing that? And see, a lot of times we're like that. We want to know what people think about it. But if we're not going to take the advice, then why bother asking for for the advice. If someone actually knows better and is smarter than you and you ask them for advice, you know what you should do? You should actually take it. We learned something in scripture about this from Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. David died and Solomon became king. Solomon died and Rehoboam became king. And when Rehoboam became king, he actually went and asked for advice. He asked two groups of people. First thing he did was he went to the elders the people who had served alongside his father. He said, what do you think I should do to, to serve this people and to rule in this nation of Israel? And the elder man said this. They said, you know what? Your father was a harsh man, and you don't, need, you don't want to be like him. And what you need to do is if you will love these people and if you will serve these people, these people will love you and serve you all the days of your life. So then after that, he went to the young men in whom he would, had grown up with. You know what that tells me? The fact that he went to the young men who grew up with him, that means that they don't know any more than he does. Am I right about that? Not only that, they're a bunch of trust fund brats, right? He was the king's kid. Who were his friends? Right? The rich kids. So he goes to all the rich kids and says, well, what do you guys think I should do? They said, oh, your father was a harsh man. You should be harsher. And you should make his waist seem like your little th finger. And he scourged them with rods, and you should scourge them with whips. And so it says that Rehoboam took the advice of the young men and rejected the counsel of the elders and God was displeased and tore the kingdom from him even from that time. You see, he took, he asked for advice, didn't he? But then he never took it. You see, well, he went, he went and asked advice of the young men, so he did take the advice. No, no, think this through. What was he doing? He was going around looking for someone that agreed with him. And I have often seen that. I've seen people go around and they'll ask advice and ask advice and ask advice. And what they're really looking for is not advice. They're looking for someone to validate the bad decision that they've decided they're going to make. And that's exactly what happened with Rehoboam. And you know what? Too many of us are, are stubborn in that respect. And that we, we really aren't interested in the opinion of others. And we're not really open. I had a situation like that in my office a couple of weeks ago. There was a man sitting there. And he, just a stubborn, stubborn man who just honestly thinks he's smarter than everybody. That's his problem. And as he was sitting there, not really asking for my advice, this is what I said to him. I said, if I gave you some advice today, would you take it? You know what he said to me? He said, well, it all depends on the advice, right? Isn't that what the, it all depends on whether I agree with it or not. That's what he's really saying. So I said, OK, here's my advice. My advice to you is that you need to start taking people's advice. <laughs> What? Yeah, you got it. That was my advice to him. And you see, the scripture says this, that where there is no counsel, a plans, man's plans go awry, but there is a safety in a multitude of counselors. 
So the four most important words are this, what is your opinion? The five most important words are this, you did a good job. You know, of all the things I'm going to say during this series, these five words are perhaps the most powerful force in the universe. When you commend somebody for doing a good job, you have the potential and the ability to change and transform their lives. There was a psychologist by the name of Henry Goddard, and he did a research project with children. And what he did was he took the ergograph. The ergograph is this rather actually simple device that me measures the energy level. And you just hook up some electrodes to, to whomever, and it measures the, the energy level, ergo meaning the Greek word for energy is all it is. And so he hooked it up to these kids, and the kids were very tired. They wore the kids out playing, first of all, hooked this er ergograph, and then what he wanted to do was he wanted to see how they responded to criticism and praise. And when he, what he discovered was this, that when these tired, tired children were praised, their energy level spiked, and they actually became more active. And when these very tired children were criticized, their energy levels, which were already low, absolutely nosedived. And so it just proved what probably all of us know, that when we are praised by others, we are energized by that. And when we are cri criticized, we are demoralized by the same. Now, the test wasn't conducted with adults, but we all know it's true. You all know what it's like. When you get praised by another human being, it does something to you. All of a sudden, this smile comes onto your face, and you have a hard time taking it off, right? You know, you know you shouldn't be that pleased, but you are. Because somebody is saying something nice about you and just lifts you up and it raises you up. On the other hand, when you are criticized, it brings you low. We all know this. Every one of us, I don't care how old you are or who you are, every one of us in this room enjoys being praised by others. You don't have to answer that, but I know it's absolutely the truth. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity of going to a conference. And I was pretty excited about it because the speaker was Paul Yonji Cho, who was the pastor of the largest church in the world. In Seoul, South Korea, he was pastoring 750,000 people. The population of our entire city was in one congregation. They just had service after service after service after service. I know there's a few of you in this church that have visited that church in Seoul, South Korea. So I had never heard him before. I went to this conference. I was very excited to listen to him. And he told what I considered a fairly bizarre story. I wasn't sure why he was telling it, but this was the story. And he did have a point, which I, doesn't really matter, but I'll tell you the story. And the story was this. He was talking about how when he preaches on Sunday morning, and he preaches service after service after service to thousands and thousands of people, he says in the afternoon he will go home and he will walk around behind his wife like this. And he will follow her around the house. And she will stop and say, why are you following me? And he'll say, I wanted to know how you thought I did today in my preaching. And she will, she will say, why are you asking me? You had 10,000 people today tell you you did a good job. You probably did a good job. Why do you need to hear it from me? And this is what he told us. He said, I needed to hear it from my wife. It didn't matter that all those people said that I did a good job and praised me. It didn't matter. I needed to hear it from the person who was the most important to me, and that was his wife. So he trained his wife to tell him he did a good job, even when he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that totally wouldn't work for me. You know, the other day I asked Kathy if she still loved me. She said, look, I told you when we got married, if it changes, I'll let you know. Sometimes you have to know what expectations to put on people. You know, I had something, all of you know that I was the speaker at the One Heart celebration at the football stadium two weeks ago. And what you might not know is I was chosen by my peers to do that. And the, the other pastors, my peers chose me, and that was a great honor. But I got something I hadn't anticipated, and you know what it was? They had also done evaluations on the event, which included my preaching. There was 93 different churches. That meant there was 93 different evaluations that were going to come in. And because I was on the committee of One Heart, guess what? These evaluations came to me. And here they are. Now, I, you know, you, you, I should have not looked, right? I should have not looked. I shouldn't have looked to see what my peers thought about my preaching. But who could resist, right? <laughs> I, had to, I had to know. And I was going through these evaluations and so curious. And, and I discovered something that I actually already knew. And this is what I already knew, was that not everybody likes my preaching. 
I know you're sitting there going, no, no, Pastor Mark, that's not true. Yeah, I know, I'm tracking with you on this. I hear you on this. But there actually are people that don't like it. Now, here's the one thing I know. Nobody's ever neutral about it. They either really like it or really don't. And you send out a survey, uh, guess what people are going to tell you? And can you imagine having a place where you get evaluated by all of your peers in your field? Think of your own job. I felt like Jacques Plante. Jacques Plante of the Montreal Canadiens used to say this. He said, how would you like a job where every time you made a mistake, a red light went off and a siren blared? <laughs> right? That's how I felt. But you see, this is the thing I've discovered about praise and criticism, and I've discovered it from reading the Gospels, is that when you look at Jesus, Jesus was actually praised, overpraised, and over-criticized. Would I be right about that? I mean, he had people, and they worshipped him. They said, Hosanna, uh, son of God, son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I mean, they just had this incredible praise for Jesus. And then there were those that had incredible criticism criticism for him. They called him a drunkard and a glutton and a friend of sinners, and they said that he did things by the power of Beelzebub. I mean, here he was, the representative of God, the Son of God, and they got he got accused of doing things by the devil. And so what happens is you have him with extraordinary criticism and extraordinary praise, and yet if you look at Jesus and how he responded, he responded almost the same in each of those situations because he didn't allow those things to move him to the point of elation or, or demoralization. What he did was he actually took the praise and sent it back up to God, and he took the criticism, and guess what he did with that? He sent that back up to God too. You know what? We have to take a whiff of it, right? When the pr criticism comes your way, you know, you take a whiff, ugh, and you send it up. And when the bouquet comes, you smell that, and then you send the roses up to God. And that's what you do. You get a whiff of it, but you don't own it. You don't carry it. Having said that, though, there was an incredible moment in Jesus' life when he was 30 years old and being baptized in the Jordan River. And he came up out of that Jordan River, and the voice from heaven came and said, You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And to me... Those are some of the most profound words in all of Scripture because Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, had his Father commend him and say, Son, you did a good job. Son, you are my Son in whom I am well pleased. So that tells me that if Jesus need affirmation, how much more the rest of us, right? But here's the key in all this. What really matters is not what people say but who says it? The criticism and the praise? Do you know what? It doesn't really matter if it comes from somebody that's not important to you. Who cares what a stranger thinks about you? You know what we care about? We care about the opinion of the people who are closest to us and know us the best. That's the only opinion that matters, and that's the kind of praise that every one of us needs and every one of us needs to give. What really matters for us is that we would get praise from the right people. Now, here's where I want to put it back to you. What, you did a good job. It's not about going around in life looking for praise. It's a matter of going around in life giving it. And when we think of the young people that are in our lives particularly, I look at young people today and I'm astounded at the level of self-esteem, the low level of self-esteem that so many of them have. And I'm thinking, why are there so many people struggling with their self-image in our world today? Why are these young people that have everything the world has to offer them, why do they struggle so much? And it's because they have failed to get the affirmation from the generation in front of them. And it's our job, our responsibility, to affirm and praise the next generation and tell them they can do it. It's our responsibility to tell them that the best Operas have not yet been written. The best songs have not yet been composed. The best books have not yet been written. The best paintings have not yet been painted. The best sermons have not yet been preached. We need to tell this generation that they can do it and that they will be the kind of people that God says they will be because he has created in them a good thing and God don't make, make no junk, right? We need to look for those opportunities to tell people that they did a good job. It's like the story of this, this son. He, his mother had a lot of grief with him because he wouldn't pick up his clothes. So finally one day she says, here's the rule, son. She says, if I come into your room and I have to pick up your clothes, I'm charging you 25 cents for every piece of clothing I have to pick up. Well, at the end of the week she comes in she says, all right, I've been picking clothes up all week off your floor. You owe me $3.75. 
The kid just rolled on his bed, threw her a $5 bill and said, there, Mom, there's a fiver. And keep the change and keep up the good work. <laughs> so the four most important words are this. You did a good job, or they were what is your opinion, right? Four most important words are what are your opinion. Five most important words are you did a good job. And the six most important words are this. I admit I made a mistake. You know what? This is so key. If you want to become a better person, you need to learn how to admit that you made a mistake. I want to go and finish the story that we began last week. I said I'd give you the conclusion. We had Nebuchadnezzar standing up, praising himself for his great honor and his great majesty that he has done for his great glory. And God said, no, this day you're coming down. This day you're going to graze the grass like the oxen. You're going to just read verse 33 and 34 of Daniel chapter 4. And we're just going to sum up the story. It says, that very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised him and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is the everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar goes on and talks about how the Lord God rules in the Most High and gives it to whomever he wishes. I want you to think about this for a moment. This was a pagan king. This was a pagan king that knew nothing about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet, because of what happened to him, because of his pride and the fact that he was abased and brought low, he finally it took him seven years. But after seven years, he finally came to that realization that I made a mistake. And he lifted up his eyes and he admitted that he had made a mistake, and then God restored him back when he realized that God was great and he wasn't. And when he made that admission that he had a problem, when he made that admission that he needed God, then God took him out of the, out of the wet, dewy grass and raised him up and put him back into the kingdom. You see, these words, I admit I made a mistake, are so vital to us as human beings. But let's be honest, a lot of times we struggle admitting we made a mistake. We struggle with this. I have seen parents so often that have made a mistake with their children, and I always tell them this, the most important thing, the, the, the smartest thing you could do is tell your kids you made a mistake. I can't tell you how many times that I have apologized to my kids. I can't tell you how many times I've apologized in life. Are you kidding? You know when the last time I had to admit I made a mistake? You know how long ago it was? An hour. Just before I got up here to preach, I had to go up to the guys who run the PowerPoint up there and, and say, because last night I never gave them the PowerPoint to run. And so I was preaching my message, and I say, look at the screen, and there was nothing on the screen. And I say, what's wrong with those guys up there? Well, I, it would help if I gave them the information to put up on the screen. You know how I always blame the sound man for everything? I got a little newsflash for you. It's never their fault. It's always my fault. But I'm never going to admit it. <laughs> But we do need to admit it. We need to admit that we made a mistake. You see, that's what the entire gospel is about, isn't it? Isn't that what the gospel is about? The whole gospel is pre predicated on this one principle, that you admit that you made a mistake. The only way you will ever receive salvation from God, the only way you will ever receive the grace of God to take you out of a fate worse than death is to admit you made a mistake and you need a Savior. And when you ask for forgiveness, boom, he visits, he restores your life, he lifts you out of the miry clay, and he sets it on the rock, and he said, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's what this is all about. We can become better people. That must mean I'm done. Let's stand together. I know there's two, two, two kinds of clapping. There's the one kind of clapping, Pastor, you're doing a good job, and the other kind of clapping, come on, you're done now. All right, all right. Church of the Rock has services every Sunday at 1397 Buffalo Place, and we invite you to join us when you're in the Winnipeg area. If you'd like a booklet to help you understand more about God's gift of forgiveness and reconciliation through Jesus Christ, please contact us, and we'd be happy to send you a free copy of the Book of Hope. Visit our website at www.churchoftherock.ca. Thank you for watching, and God bless you.